at whatever time you're watching this video or podcast, I hope that you're having a wonderful day. And if you aren't, it can change in a moment just like that by remembering, believing, and identifying with who Christ has made us through the cross. It's Romans chapter 6. We're actually going to be seeing that in James chapter 1 in this video. We're picking up where we left off last time in James chapter 1 and today, beginning in verse 18 and getting through verse 21, and it's going to be a great video and podcast, so I encourage you to watch the whole 30 minutes. Well, let's get into it, James chapter 1, as James has been dealing with the proper perspective towards the temptation against our faith. And, and this the principles that he gives about temptation against our faith, and again, God tests, but the devil tempts. And I've said this numerous times in past videos, but one event, in one event, there can be temptation and there can be testing. And so these truths that James is giving can be applied really to both situations. And so he, beginning in verse 18 here, he says, Of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, Again, I, I want to just clarify this and, and put this as a setting. Remember, James is dealing with the proper perspective about, about temptations. So the Holy Spirit led James to bring us and the recipients that he wrote to initially and us and every believer in every generation. He's bringing us back to the gospel. So as it concerns the testing of our faith and the temptations that we will face, you know, we have to go back to the gospel because the gospel or the word of truth as he refers to it here is, or the message of the cross, whatever terminology you want to use, the same thing. It is where our victory comes from, from Jesus and what he's accomplished for us. So let's take a look at it. He says, of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth. That statement of his own will, he begat us. It means for his own pleasure, he gave us the new birth. In other words, James is referring here to the born-again experience, salvation of every, of every believer through Christ. And we didn't choose Christ, he chose us. And, and so again, James is bringing the recipients back to the gospel, the cross. And so he uses this terminology, the word of truth, literally the message of truth, the gospel. Uh, again, you could call it the message of the cross. It's salvation from sin through the death of Christ. And I just give here some word of truth scriptures, and I apologize, I cover up part of it here, but uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, uh, Paul writes, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth of your salvation, of whom, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then in Colossians 1 and verse 5, Paul also, writing again, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And then Jesus, in, in John 8, 32, that's where he made this statement, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, that terminology, the word of truth, is a synonym for the gospel. It's a synonym for the message of the cross. It's a synonym for so many other terms that were used for the gospel in the early church. And, and when you look at different terms that were used, again, you can see it here, Paul used that term at least two times in his epistles. So he was familiar with it. It's, it's the word of truth or the message of truth. All right, moving on here in verse 18, he says he begat. That's referring, again, to the born-again experience. He said this, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, remember who James was writing to. He was writing to uh, Jewish believers that had spread out over the uh, Roman Empire that day, whether through persecution or whether through the Lord just leading them after the day of Pentecost, they go out and they're spread out all over the Roman Empire. These were Jewish believers. James refers to them as a kind of first fruits of God's creatures. What does that mean? It means it's, a, it's the word first fruit, it means that it's the first portion of a larger group that will accept Christ. And 
When he made that statement there, a kind of first fruits, it means this ultimately, that God saved Jews first, not all of them, of course, but a remnant of Jews. He saved them first as an example to the world of what Jesus will do in any person's life who believes in Christ. And so it's so important to understand that James was referring to that Jewish aspect that God saved Jews first. And that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jews were saved. Several days after that, another 5,000 Jews were saved. And that's just the numbers that were given in the first several chapters of the book of Acts. There would have been most likely tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Jews that were saved, that were the initial recipients, you could say, of the gospel experience, the born-again experience. And James is saying here, that God saved us first as a first fruit, okay? Again, a small portion of a larger group that's going to get saved. Now, some could interpret that as meaning that what James is saying is, as well, not only does the, will the gospel save anyone, Jew or Gentile, but it also, you could read into it, that there's coming a day in which the whole nation of Israel will finally recognize Jesus Christ as her Messiah, as the Lamb of God, as her Savior, and they will finally accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and they'll get saved as a nation. Now that will not happen until the very end of the seven-year tribulation period, and when, when the Jews actually get to that point, the nation of Israel, I should say, uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, tells us that at, by that point, Two-thirds of Israel will die during primarily the second half of the tribulation period. And so one-third will remain. And Zechariah 13 lets us know that that one-third remnant, they're the ones that will recognize Jesus, to see, the, see the wounds in his hands, his side, and his feet. And they will, they will recognize him that, that he truly is the Messiah, the Savior, their Lord, the Lamb of God. And so that very well could be read into this as well. And also another scripture out of 1 Timothy chapter 1, 15 and 16 that goes right along with this that Paul wrote. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering that as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul was referring to himself actually in the same way that, that James was writing, that Paul says, God saved me first. And that didn't mean, of course, I think you know this, that Paul was the first one born again under the, under the, the church age, not at all. He was just meaning it that God saved him as an example that God can save anybody, and oh, and how true that is, and that that example of Paul and of the Jews being saved, for that, that is still an example for us today. All right, moving on into the next several verses, verse 19 and 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of of God. Now, in these two verses, James explains in a brief way, concise way, but a very powerful way, so much truth about, about the words that we speak and about our reaction to situations. And again, he's putting this in the context of how we deal with testing and also with temptation. So in those times of testing and temptation, be swift to hear and slow to speak. For he says, the wrath of man produces not the righteousness of God. It doesn't produce anything good at all. So often, whenever we're tested and tempted, it is our words that get us in trouble. So often, so many problems in our life are there due to us having a lack of patience. We have this thinking, I'm just going to speak my mind into this situation or to that person. I'm going to tell them the way it is. And what happens so often is that we are swift to speak 
and we're slow to hear. But hear what the voice of God is telling us through these scriptures here. Be swift to hear, slow to speak. The word swift to hear, it means quick, speedy minded to hear. And then slow to speak, it means deliberately slow or unhurried minded to speak. Does that make sense? Uh, let that sink in. Swift to hear. Be quick, speedy minded to hear. There's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Because we're to be swift, quick minded to hear versus being quick to speak. So he said here, we're to be slow to speak. The word, that means deliberately slow, unhurried. I mean, deliberately unhurried to speak. I want to give you some what I refer to as slow to speak scriptures because there's so many scriptures in the Bible and I'm just giving a few that deal with this very same thing. So Solomon writes in Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool when he holds his peace is counted wise. And he that shuts his lips is esteemed as a man of understanding. Then he says in Proverbs 16, 32, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And then in Proverbs 15 and verse 1, he says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, so much could be said here about this, but the word really speaks for itself. Again, Proverbs 15, 1, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Can I encourage you today and even challenge you? Be swift to hear and slow to speak. And when we do speak, let it be with the wisdom of God. Let it be with grace, as Paul would write in one of his epistles. Let, your, let, our, let our speech be seasoned with grace. And so that's the way our words should be. Our words should not stir up strife. For And I'm talking here, and, and also Solomon and... And when James is writing here, and also Paul, when he wrote about you know, our, our words, he's not talking about uh, the controversy that should be. Sometimes, sometimes there is necessary controversy. In other words, when, when, when evil has invaded a situation, well, you know, when evil has invaded a situation, there, sometimes there's controversy there. They have to stand up for the truth. But get this, most of the time, things in our life are not controversial. I want to make that point very clear. Most of the time in our everyday life, things are not like that. They're not controversial. Most of the time, uh, if, we're, if we just get controversial minded, we will stir up unnecessary strife. So I want to challenge you and encourage you all at the same time. Don't stir up unnecessary strife. Actually, just do the opposite. Let our words put out unnecessary strife. Let our words bring peace, the peace of God, into a situation. Let our words bring uh, strength and the, and the help of the Lord, the wisdom of God, the righteousness of God, into the situation rather than stirring up unnecessary strife, actually through our words put it down, or I, I should say even lack of words put out the unnecessary strife. But he says here in verse 20, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. That, that word wrath there is the Greek word orge, and I'm going to put up several notes here. It is the expression of deep-seated anger, retaliation, Revenge. Remember that. That's orge. He said here, for the wrath of men, he's using it in a negative way. Okay, our own anger, our retaliation, our revenge, it works not or produces not the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is the Greek word dikaiosune for righteousness. It sounds funny to us in the English, but it was a very common word in the early church. It means that which is right, perfect, and approved by God. And here, James is referring to God's righteousness, Christ, in our condition, not really in our position in the heavenlies. Because as a believer, we have a position in the heavenlies. We're seated in Christ in heavenly places. But we also have a condition here on earth. 
And so our position never changes, but our condition does. And so James is referring to righteousness in our condition. And that can change based on whether or not we act in faith or whether or not we act by faith in self. That's so important. Now, uh, I want to give this scripture here because Paul says something very, very similar to what, what uh, James wrote. And I'm going to take myself off the screen. He said in, in Romans chapter 12, 17 through 21, this is a New American Standard. It says it very, very good. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Now, that anyone, that means saved or unsaved. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Or in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And so do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What a powerful statement that is by the Apostle Paul that goes right along with what James was writing here. Never return evil for evil. And that's what James is referring to here, that, that the wrath of man does not produce what is right in the eyes of God. And this is so important as it concerns us as believers that we deliberately, get that, deliberately, on purpose, intentionally, put out fires. Okay, does that make sense? We put out unnecessary fires. We are to be peacemakers, not strife makers. Okay, peacemakers, not strife makers. And that's so important. Sometimes, sometimes being a peacemaker and putting out strife can be viewed as weakness. In other words, holding back our words can be viewed as weakness. When in reality, it's strength. It's the strength of God to actually hold back our words, to not speak our mind. That's the strength and the wisdom and the fruit of the Spirit operating in our life. One of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control or Spirit-controlled passions, desires, instincts, so that whenever we're uh, instigated or provoked to speak and to stir up strife with our words or to retaliate or revenge, okay, to get back with someone, instead of speaking, we don't speak. Instead of retaliating with our words, we actually take it to the Lord in prayer and we praise Him. And, and that's so, so important for a child of God. That is a sign of maturity in the Lord. All right, moving on to the next passage, and you see it there in the top of the screen, verses 21 through 25. Be doers of the word and not just hearers. Boy, this begins such an important part in, in the epistle of James. He begins with verse 21, and this as far as we'll get today. Wherefore, lay apart or lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now, as you can see there on the notes on the screen here, when he says wherefore, or that means for this reason, and things like that, wherefore or therefore, we're not to take those words like that for granted. We're to, we're to pay attention to those things. So basically, for this reason, okay, lay aside or lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain what that is in just a moment. But he begins with that term, and it's, it's translated in the King James, at least in this passage, lay apart. It's the Greek word apotithemi, and it means to cast off, to put off, to lay aside as one takes off a garment. Now what James is doing is alluding to a truth that would become very common in the New Testament church and should be common for us as well. I, I put on the screen here some what I refer to as lay aside scriptures. This is so, so important that we understand this truth. Okay, it's a new covenant truth that we can simply lay aside, okay, sinfulness in our life. That's the way we can approach it through the finished work of the cross. We can lay aside sinfulness. 
Uh, in Romans 13 and verse 12, Paul writes this, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I'm going to stop right here. So Paul is explaining to the early church here, this is how we to approach evil. Based on what he taught throughout earlier in the book of Romans, okay, Romans uh, 5, justification, Romans 6, identification, Romans 7, the wrong way to deal with sin, that's through law. And then Romans chapter 8 is the conclusion of it all, that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We are to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, and, and we're to expect the grace of God and the Holy Spirit's help in our life. And so based on those truths, we simply lay aside the works of darkness. And we put on the armor of light. That's the character of Jesus. He said a very similar thing in Ephesians 4 and verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So Paul is saying the same exact thing, just using different words. Lay aside the deeds of the old man. Through our union with Christ, our old man has been crucified with Christ. And that's what Paul explained in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. We're dead to sin. We have no relationship with it anymore because we've been crucified, co-crucified with Christ and co-buried and co-resurrected with Christ. And through our death with Christ, that's how we put off the deeds of the old man, okay? We're not an old man anymore. We're a new creation in Christ. And let me just, let me just hone in on that. We are not old men, spiritually speaking, becoming new creations in Christ. No, no. We're a new creation in Christ. So, But based on our identification with Christ, we put off the old and we put on the new. All right, in Colossians 3 and verse 8, But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. It's an encouragement to me because... It lets us know that, that that was a temptation back in the early believers' lives, that they would get angry, that they would have actually also have filthy communication out of their mouth. And Paul says, put it off and keep putting it off. And so and then in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, he writes this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed or surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I will summarize how we lay aside with this statement here. We lay aside sin to remembering, believing, and identifying with Christ's work on the cross. That's Romans chapter 6. And in James chapter 1 verse 21, he had just dealt with the word of truth. All right, so how are we to lay aside filthiness and superfluity of nonetheless, okay? We do that through our identification with the word of truth, the gospel. And so, different terminology, the same truth. Now, you can see this chart on the screen here, and some of you might be familiar with this, and I'll take myself off here. But you can see it here. Here's really how we lay aside again in, in, a, in a graph format. You can see us on the left-hand side. That's our old man. That's who we were before Christ or who we would be without Christ. But we put our faith in Christ and what he accomplished for us at the cross. And by doing so, by faith alone in Christ, by knowing and believing, get this, our old man was crucified with Christ, as you can see it there on the screen. And, and then we're also buried and, and then resurrected with Christ. But notice, where does the old man stay? It stays in the grave. It stays crucified. And then we're resurrected with Christ and we're a new man. We're a new person in Christ Jesus, a new creation of Christ, in which Christ is reigning in our life as we live by faith and who He is and what He's accomplished for us at the cross. So this chart right here, and you can download this. This will be in the first comment of this video. This really shows us how we lay aside the, the, the wickedness and we put on 
righteousness. All right, continuing on in verse 21 here, uh, digging into the specific words that James used, he uses the word filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now, that's not actually James's words. That's that's King James terminology. Uh, I think if if uh, if we were to tell someone today, you know, I'm really dealing with a superfluity of naughtiness. They would be like, "You're dealing with what?" Okay, so this is very old school terminology that we have to translate into modern terminology. But filthiness there refers to moral impurity in one's spirit. What does James say? He doesn't say fight against it. He, he doesn't say wrestle it. Okay. He doesn't say defeat sin through your works. I want to make that clear. James is not saying that. What is he giving people? He's giving people and us today in this generation the new covenant principle of laying sin aside through our identification with the word of truth, the gospel. So, but he says here that we've got impurity, moral impurity in our spirit. And that's very, very similar to what uh, the terminology that Paul used. Again, just different terminology in the English. And then he uses the word, and, and this is King James again, the superfluity of none of this. That means all that remains of wickedness in one's spirit. It could be translated in this way, and it is actually in, in many modern translations. It translated as the overflow of wickedness in us. Now get that. Lay aside the overflow of wickedness that's in your heart. Again, he doesn't say wrestle against it or confess your way through it. No, he says just simply Lay it aside like you're laying aside a garment. The only way that's possible is through our remembering, believing, and identifying with Christ's work at the cross, a.k.a. the word of truth. All right, he goes on to say, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. That word receive with meekness, it means an attitude of humble submission. Well, that is so important because this is in the present tense uh, verb. So it means receive and keep on receiving with meekness the engrafted word. Again, meekness is an attitude of humble submission. That's how we are to approach God and approach the word of truth. Okay, the gospel, what Christ has accomplished for us with an attitude of humble submission to it. All right, then he says, uh, the engrafted word. Now, that word engrafted simply means implanted. And it refers to a seed that's been sown in the ground and is now growing. So whatever is implanted becomes one with the individual. You get that? So he says here, receive with an attitude of submission and humility the implanted word. And that word there that James is referring to, he's referring to re them re continuing to receive the word of truth that's been implanted in their hearts. Get this, this is what James is saying. Keep on receiving the gospel truth is what he's saying. Keep on receiving it with an attitude of humble submission. Submit yourself to the cross. Submit yourself to the truth and keep on doing it. And get this, the, the, the word of truth it's been implanted in us. It's been implanted in you. In you, you have a spiritual implant, and that spiritual implant is the word of truth. It's the gospel. It's your identification with his death, burial, and resurrection. Keep on receiving that. Well, that is key to us living a life of victory that we keep on receiving the implanted word of truth. And he says here this statement, which is able to save your souls. Which is able to save your souls, it means it has the inherent power to sanctify your souls. James is using the word save in regards to our progressive sanctification, the same way that Paul used the word save in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, for the message of the cross, that's the word of truth, okay, is to them that perish, 
foolishness. But unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the power of God? The message of the cross. Or in James's case, or even Paul, the word of truth. It's able to save our souls. That word able actually is the Greek word dunamis. So get this, what James is saying, led by the Holy Spirit, that the word of truth inherently has God's power in it that is able to save our souls. And save, again, is not referring just to the initial salvation experience. It includes that, but it includes that initial justification, our progressive sanctification, and one day our future glorification. Because our salvation in Christ is a whole salvation. It's not just an in-part salvation. He did his part uh, to, to, to save us out of hell, okay? Deliver us out of sin. Now the rest of it is up to you. No, no, no. That's not the salvation that we have in Christ. The salvation that we have in Christ is able to save us from the very beginning when we say yes to Christ and keep us saved, and not only keep us saved, but cause us to flourish spiritually, so that we are a reflection of Jesus on this earth, and so that we get to know God as our Father intimately, and we get to know Jesus as our Savior and as our friend intimately, okay? All of that is within the word of truth, okay? And so that's what James is referring to. And so all of us need to keep going back to the gospel. That is where our victory is in to begin with, and that's where it stays. And I should, I'm saying that it's He, it's Jesus, and what He's accomplished for us. Well, that is where we're going to stop today. I believe that you've been blessed. God bless you, and have a wonderful day in Jesus.